right, so in today's talk, um, we'll be covering a wide range of scales. We'll be going from molecules all the way to molecular clouds. We'll be learning about how the molecules in molecular clouds make their journey uh, through the star and planet formation process to end up in planetary systems such as our own. It's actually really hard right now to give a talk about planet formation, surprisingly, uh, because we thought we had it all figured out in the last, like, sort of, like, 10 years ago. We thought we knew everything, so, or at least roughly everything. In those last 10 years, we've been learning a tremendous amount about how creative nature really is. The discovery of exoplanets uh, around um, binary stars, uh, exoplanets close, whizzing around the surfaces of their host star, almost touching their host star, uh, orbiting far, far away, well beyond Pluto's orbit. We see a wide variety of possible outcomes that look nothing like ours. And so, uh, in this talk, I'll be discussing or what we've sort of learned in those 10 years and what sort of the picture we have, at least right now, what, what picture we have that's emerging. You'll be hearing me talk a lot about disks. And when I talk about disks, they won't be galactic disks or black hole disks, although, you know, disks are everywhere at all scales, but they will be protoplanetary disks. So here is a nice artist's conception of a young, uh, let's see if this, oops. Oh, I can't use the laser pointer. Ah, here, this will be a new skill for me. All right, so where is the mouse? Here we go. So let's see. So here is our young star. It's roughly a few million years old. It's surrounded by an accretion disk. The accretion rate's a little bit lower than maybe what you're used to for a black hole disk. Um, and this disk is made up of uh, relatively cold material. It's a lot of gas, like H2 molecular gas. Uh, dust, and those dust grains are often coated with ices. And so out of this material, you have, uh, hopefully, planets forming, or planetesimal bodies. So here in this nice artist's conception, actually I've zoomed in a little bit so you can see it a bit better, uh, is, is this young Jupiter that's uh, oops, uh, gathering material out of the surrounding circumstellar material. Um, so it is inheriting a lot of what's going on from its parent circumstellar disk, a lot of that gas, that ice, and that dust. So, let's see. To at least give you sort of a background uh, from where we thought we were 10 years ago, uh, we, ha we started off with, you know, most of our information about planet formation, and uh, we extended to other planet, exoplanet formation, uh, came from our solar system. We have a lot of data. No surprise, we're here. Uh, the first thing you can tell from looking at this, uh, this screenshot, so this is actually a really cool app if you ever want to go play with, uh, let's, I'm a laser pointer addict. Uh, <laughs> let's see. If you want to go play around and look at the solar system from various geometries, the skylive.com, it's, it's a cool interactive web app. And you can zoom in and out uh, and look at it from all different angles. But the, the main thing to take away from this is that the orbits of all the planets are pretty planar. The one that's sort of off here, and here we go, it's not showing up, is it? There it goes. Over here is Pluto, which, as you know, is no longer a planet. So we can just say all the planets are planar, and we're happy. So this is actually maybe not so surprising given the previous image you saw, the cartoon of a disk. And actually this idea that the planets, all of our planets, formed out of a disk isn't really that new. In fact, it's an idea that's more than 200 years old. It's called the nebular hypothesis. Uh, and often it's actually attributed to Laplace. But 50 years earlier, Immanuel Kant actually published in the Universal Natural Natural History and Theory of the Heavens, which is obviously the English translation, uh, his own nebular hypothesis in uh, about 1755, where you see you have in the third stage right here, something that looks kind of like a disc, maybe a ring. I, you know, some artistic liberties were taken here. Uh, and out of this disc of material, the planets collapse and they form the spheres and then you have your solar system. Great. So that actually, that hasn't been rewritten. That's still okay. The 200-year-old idea still holds. 
planets are in fact forming out of disks. Don't worry. The next piece of information we had um, was sort of the compositional gradient. So if you are very close to the host star, you have uh, the rocky or host star, the sun. <laughs> scientists speak, right? Uh, here, if you have the sun over here on the left, the inner planets are fairly rocky. And you go a little bit further out, and you have your gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. And then a little bit further, you have your ice giants. And it, it fit kind of in the picture. You know, the, the rocky planets that formed closer in, maybe they were very, they were very, they were rock rich and ice poor. So as they were forming and colliding and fragmenting, it wasn't a great place to form large planets. But as you get a little further out, maybe you have a little bit more ice. Ice tends to be a little sticky. And it helps grains collide and stick and grow. So there you can maybe form something that's a few tens of Earth masses. And that's massive enough that it can start accreting gas rapidly and, forming your, and form your gas giants. That's OK. I like it. And then as you get further out, there's, you get more and more ice further from the star because it's cooler and cooler and cooler. And so you end up forming ice giant-like planets. And so all was well and good, and we thought everything was OK. We understood planet formation. This should apply everywhere, right? Kind of. There were actually still some op many open questions, uh, even for our own solar system and our own Earth. For example, it's still an open question uh, where Earth got its Volatile. So I guess I'll, I'll explain that. So you have your rocks, what I'll call the refractory material, and you have your volatiles, like water, like carbon dioxide, like uh, nitrogen, for example, the things that are more loosely bound to your planet, your volatile things. So here you have the Earth. The atmosphere, mostly nitrogen. Yay, that's good for us. A little bit of oxygen and some uh, trace species, like nitrous oxide, methane, carbon dioxide, and, and other things. Uh, then you have your crust. It's mostly rocky things. It's silicates. It's got some magnesium. It's got some aluminum. It has iron and calcium. Uh, and then the core, actually, the very core under us right now is one of the most poorly constrained parts of our, uh, of, uh, our compositional information of the Earth. We know there's iron. We know there's nickel. We know there are iron-nickel alloys. But there seems to be something a little sprinkled in there, something a little bit lighter, because the density is a little bit lighter than if it was a pure iron-nickel uh, core. And one possibility uh, put out by, actually, our uh, Michigan's own Jackie Lee is that maybe there's a little bit of, ki uh, of carbon in there, too. Now, it, you don't have to look too hard, but there's a, there's a rich diversity of both, well, planet types and moon types, as well as compositions of these objects. And, and we're learning more about this by sending missions to these different uh, objects. So up here you have Jupiter at the very top. No surprise, it's mostly hydrogen and helium because it was one of those planets that got a massive enough core and was able to accrete all the gas from around it. And most of the gas in space is hydrogen and a little bit of helium. So no surprise, the envelope is mostly hydrogen and helium. But those beautiful band-like structures, the things we know and love, that's coming from clouds of ammonia and water vapor. In fact, actually, oxygen and our understanding of oxygen on Jupiter is still a puzzle, at least until Juno, Juno tells us a bit more, the mission that's currently there. The last mission that went there, Galileo, went, fell into the atmosphere of Jupiter and accidentally, not accidentally, it, by chance, <laughs> fell into a dry spot. Uh, in the atmosphere, and they actually didn't measure any water vapor, which is a weird, because it has extra carbon, it has extra nitrogen, and it's extra volatile things. Usually those things should go together. Uh, so hopefully Juno will tell us soon more. What, was it actually a fluky spot, a dry spot in the atmosphere, or is it actually oxygen poor? That will rewrite the book of planet formation, that alone. Uh, Mars uh, is obviously a rocky planet, not much of an atmosphere to be seen, but it has ice caps like our planet. Uh, but they're not just water ice caps, they also have a little bit of CO2 in there. So you've got a carbon, carbon dioxide and water mix on your ice caps. Uh, Venus down here has an atmosphere like Earth, it's actually pretty similar in mass. Uh, but unlike us, where our majority is, uh, of our atmosphere is N2 dominated, molecular nitrogen dominated, it's actually dominated by carbon dioxide. So it's a runaway greenhouse, uh, runaway greenhouse effect, such that the temperature of the surface and the pressures are so high 
that we can't even land a probe on it. It's too harsh. It also has you know, sulfuric acid. It's, it's not the best you know, place to go spend your vacation. So the, the planets are you know, interesting in their own right, but I think often goes, what goes unlooked, uh, overlooked, are the, the moons, where you have a really interesting chemistries going on as well. So Enceladus, uh, one of the moons of Saturn, has, as it looks like a, an ice ball here, right? Uh, it actually has a giant subsurface ocean. This was found because as it was orbiting Saturn, there was a little bit of a wobble to the orbit. And so what it means is that you have a global ocean, a free-floating core, and it's causing the sort of moment of inertia to be a little weird. And so they were able to in actually infer the internal structure by the wobbling orbit. It's pretty cool. Oh, and then they confirm that there is water by the fact that there are plumes coming off the surface, water-rich plumes uh, coming off the surface of Enceladus. Now, Titan is actually one of my favorite uh, down here. Uh, the mouse is not looking. Here it goes. Uh, so Titan, in many ways, is actually quite similar to Earth. Uh, in many ways, it's not similar at all. But uh, it's the only other body in the solar system that also has a molecular nitrogen-dominated atmosphere. So you think, okay, that's great for a breathable atmosphere, yay. Um, the rest is a sort of methane and H2, no oxygen. Um, you can zoom in and, and see a little bit more. Uh, so I, I call it like one of Earth's closest siblings. It's really, you know, pretty small, two times bigger than the moon. It's actually, it's, its atmosphere is a little bit bigger than Earth's. Uh, it's just a little bit more volatile rich than Earth. Uh, so yeah, similarities has this nitrogen dominated atmosphere. It also is the only other object in the solar system to have stable surface lakes. No other object has lakes on the surface besides, you know, Titan and Earth. So there's some pretty interesting similarities. But the main difference here is that the surface of Titan is almost 200 below freezing. So it's a little bit cold. And so if, uh, this is a beautiful image, actually, from Cassini that I'll show you. And, and I have a nice demo here. This will be interesting to see if this works. Uh, so this is a beautiful radar image of the surface from Cassini. Cassini is the mission that just recently plummeted into the surface of Saturn. You may have seen it in the news about a month ago. It spent you know, about 10 years get to collecting lots of data. And so at the end of its mission, the, the right thing to do is to, crack, to burn it up in Saturn's atmosphere so that you don't accidentally contaminate lovely Titan. So you might ask, well, how does this happen? How do you actually get methane lakes? Well, it helps that it's very, very, very cold. It's so cold that it's actually similar to the temperature of liquid nitrogen, which is in this uh, foam container, I think, still. I, yeah, there's some in there. Uh, because safety first, I'm gonna put some goggles on. And so what I'm gonna do here is, so on Earth it's warm enough that methane exists in the gas. There's a lot of glare here. Uh, so in this tube, this is feeding down to, uh, I don't know if you call it gas a faucet, a faucet <laughs> that, um, that will provide methane gas. And so what I'm gonna do here, they yell at me if I do anything harm, dangerous. Okay, thanks guys. <laughs> I don't need gloves, do I? No, I don't need gloves, okay. <laughs> All right, I'm not an experimentalist, just guy, I'm a theorist. I'm gonna submerge this tube. Is it supposed to do that? Okay. Uh, and so this is a test tube. It's just a normal test tube, there's nothing in it. It's moving a lot. I'm going to put the tube into this test tube and I'm gonna turn on the methane gas. Is the camera, oh, the camera's on, this is great. So you can watch what's happening up close when I burn my eyebrows off. Uh, <laughs> so here, so right now the, ooh, it's already done. Here we go. That was pretty quick, I think. Let's check. Oh, that's not enough. All right, we're gonna keep going. That was way, that won't, that won't be very cool. So uh, I guess more fun facts, I don't know. Uh, hmm? More gas, always. Turn it up. That's cool. All right. So some cool fun facts about methane while we're waiting. Yeah, so. You're good. good? How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> OK, there's a little bit in there. That'll be. So do you see it? 
That is, where is the camera? There is the camera. Liquid methane down there. You see it? That, so before this all disappears, well, you know, if you're going to send your mission to land, um, everything's off, yes, okay. You know, if we're going to go, if you want to go visit, I would probably recommend not taking your Falcon X with your rocket propulsion. No! Yes! It worked. Yay! It might end poorly. <laughs> All right. I'm glad I didn't break that. All right, I'm just going to leave. Should I put it back in while it's cold? All right. Yeah. It's going to keep burning for a while. <laughs> so yeah, so Titan's pretty cool. It actually, uh, the composition of Titan uh, internally, you can keep watching that if you want. Um, it's over. Uh, it's actually only about 50% dust, silicate grains. Um, the rest is ice, like water and ammonia ice. And that's actually kind of similar to the composition of a comet. So this is almost, it's like a hybrid comet moon. Uh, it's much bigger than a comet, way bigger than a comet. In fact, this moon here, or the lake here, the Kraken Mare, I think I said that right, uh, <laughs> uh, is about the size of Texas. So it's a very, this is a, a very big moon, but it's got a very similar internal structure to a comet, which is about half ice, half dust. We often call them, you know, dirty snowballs. Um, but, okay, so enough with the solar system. We've had enough uh, wonderful examples of amazing chemistry as you can get from planets it, and, and moons, obviously, uh, within our own solar system. Fortunately, we're now in a new era where we don't even have to be super creative. We don't have to necessarily even imagine what's out there, but of course we do because it's fun. Uh, but nature is providing many awesome examples. And these are just a few press release images from exoplanet discoveries in the last five years, many of which um, came out of the Kepler mission. Uh, so here, you know, we have a hazy rock, rocky water world. We have a world that the surface is so hot that the ground is lava. These are not real images, obviously. I should probably say that, but these are, these are artists' recreations of what the world should look like, given what we know about it. Uh, down here, uh, I have a mouse here. Well, uh, on the bottom left, I'll just use my words, uh, is a, a wa it's actually a gas giant planet, but it was the first discovery of a planet with a stratosphere where there's a temperature inversion. Uh, our own stratosphere is where the temperature goes from warm to cool to warm. This does the same thing. It has the same sort of transition where it gets warmer with radius. And that was just discovered this year. And then there was this older, you maybe heard about this diamond planet. So it's a carbon-rich planet that's extremely dense and probably largely diamond. Uh, so th th we have this wonderful, there's so many outcomes of the planet formation process, so many different compositions and so many different uh, possible, you know, of outcomes, basically. But there's also some not so exotic examples that are perhaps even more exciting for our own purposes. Uh, planets that are existing, rocky planets that exist within the habitable zones of their stars. So the habitable zone is this region where liquid water can exist on the surface of a planet. These are planets that are potentially habitable. They are not inhabited. So when you see your press releases, don't get too excited and buy your tickets or send a lot of money to Elon Musk, just, uh, you know, hold off. This just means there's a nice, a good chance, but we actually don't know what their composition is in detail. We don't know if they have lakes, necessarily, or an, an atmosphere we can breathe. Maybe they're a Venus-like world where it might rain sulfuric acid. We don't want to be there. This, notice the date at the bottom. Actually, what, wait, Fred, wasn't? Eliza, you're a student, where are you? There you are. PhD student, PhD, physics PhD student of University of Michigan discovered the first rocky exoplanet in the habitable zone around a star. Yeah, go blue right there. And it was just three years ago. Since then, since it's been productive three years, 12 more were discovered and it's awesome. We have now a bunch of different options but again, we only know that these are rocky. They're not, they don't have giant gas-rich envelopes. We don't know much about their atmospheres. And they're far enough away from the star, it's hard to actually directly characterize the atmospheres. But they're prime targets for this in the future. So in addition to seeing all these uh, exciting new prospects and habitable zone distances, we're also, with Kepler, getting a statistical sample of 
the varieties of architectures of planetary systems. So this is the Kepler, I can't say this word, or orrery. We have an example of an orrery over here for the solar system. It's actually moving at the correct relative angular velocities, I think. Uh, and so it's going over there. But this is the orrery of all the planets that Kepler had viewed as of a couple of years ago. Uh, and what you'll notice, here's my mouse, here, this, you see the solar system labeled over there? Those rings by the solar system are just the inner planets. Jupiter is the next outermost ring. And basically all of these solar systems, solar systems, stellar systems, uh, fit well within our solar system's orbit. They're, they're really compact. You have not only many planets, you know, right close to the surfaces of their stars, but you have gas giants. So you remember the old picture, you know, gas giants are supposed to form a little bit further out, where you, maybe it's a little bit easier to form a core that can accrete gas. But these, you know, all of these discoveries, and, and the hot Jupiter discoveries before Kepler, sort of threw that away, threw that picture away. Uh, and so there are questions, did they form there so close to the star, and, you know, did they form in situ, or did they form further out and migrate in? Um, so, all right, so to skip ahead a little bit, to get to the fun stuff, Oh, this is, I have to show this. We have one movie, actually, of a planetary system in orbit. So we don't have to just make cool cartoons. We can now actually image planets orbiting their star. So if you, did, you see, guys, did you guys see it move? Should I play it again? Okay. There you go. This was made, actually, by a PhD student, Jason Wong. And because these have been directly imaged, they actually, they even have spectra associated with each of the planet, meaning they can decompose the compositions of the planets. And so now they can measure the amount of carbon relative to oxygen in all four of these planets. And the neat thing is, it's different. They're not all the same. If you think they would have all been cut from you know, exactly the same cloth, they should have had all the same composition. But because of the gradients, the temperature gradients, as you move away from the star, you can have different compositions for planets close to the star than further out. So, um, so to, to end the, the intro part, <laughs> Uh, nature is very creative. We see sol planetary systems that are very compact. They all you know, can fit well within the orbit of Mercury. We have planetary systems like the one I just showed you, the one with the, the cool image. Two of those planets are well beyond the orbits of Pluto. That's a really extended system. It's also very young. That's why we can see those planets. They're still pretty hot. Um, let's see. We're beginning to characterize abundances of uh, exoplanets. But at the same time, we're also getting lots of rich data from missions to, to bodies within our own solar system. So actually flying and taking samples has taught us a lot about, for example, the methane lakes of Titan. So where does this all come from? I'm sure some of you are thinking in the back of your head, well, duh, I know exactly where all of this comes from. We're all star stuff. Didn't you ever you know, listen to Carl Sagan ever? And I, I think probably most of you or many of you are familiar with this quote. Yes, yeah. Uh, essentially, nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. Which to me is probably one of the most profound statements that has been made you know, in this century. Uh, granted, I am sort of biased. Uh, to, to just to, but to, to emphasize, he's, it's not, that's not an exaggeration. This is the periodic table if you label it based on where everything, where every atom comes from. At the very top, hydrogen and helium came from the Big Bang. There's a little bit of helium, obviously, from nuclear burning in the cores of stars, but largely hydrogen and helium, they're the primordial parts, and uh, uh, some, some lithium, et cetera. But most of everything else on this entire plot is made in stars, so you have for example, the green is exploding massive stars. The yellow, I guess my mouse isn't showing up. The yellow is dying low mass stars, like what our sun will one day go through. And they are contributing to the global chemical budget of our, of our universe, of our galaxy. But that's only a tiny, actually, that's only part of the picture. It's an important part of the picture. But these atoms don't just miraculously come together and form you and me, or form Earth. In fact, there's a long, long process to get there. And so these atoms are really only a part of the picture. And to get from the star stuff into the planets, you actually have to go through the process of forming compounds and molecules in space. Now, I think in terms of timing, 
I may have to skip ahead a little bit. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I think I probably so. Um, astrochemistry is a, a pretty, I, I won't give the full history. This is a very brief history. It's a very new field. Uh, the first molecules were discovered over 100 years ago, but they were in the spectrum, or they were in star spot, discovered in star spots in the sun through spectra. Uh, they were titanium oxide, magnesium hydride, uh, and actually, they were discovered at the Mount Wilson Observatory, which maybe some of you are familiar with. It's a very famous observatory. It's where the expansion of the universe was discovered, where dark matter was discovered by Fritz Zwicky, but also molecules in space, which is, I think, pretty cool. It's a pretty significant uh, jump. And so shortly after, more molecules were discovered in the spectra of stars, CN, CH, and 2, H2, CO, uh, in the 30s. But basically, uh oh, I'll just skip this guy. That's an example spectrum of a star spot. And there are lots of little lines in the bottom most curve. The top is a lab spectrum, and the bottom is what you see in a star spot. It took actually a 30, 30 well, let's see. It, the first interstellar molecule was actually discovered in 1937, but they didn't actually know what it was. They were just like, there's a really narrow line, and it looks, doesn't look like a star, uh, the line from a star, which is typically broad due to the pressure of the star. It's very narrow. Uh, so they indicated, you know, an interstellar character, but they didn't know what it was. They fortunately didn't have to wait long because shortly thereafter, in the same year, somebody said, actually, well, we have spectroscopy and we know it is actually CH. It was the, f so this was the first molecule detected in, in free floating in space. And this was sort of in the line of sight between, they were looking at a star and there was intervening gas. And they saw CH in that gas. So then for about 30 years, astrochemistry kind of sat in waiting because no one knew why there were molecules in space. It was weird. Space is supposed to be a terribly harsh place. There's a lot of radiation, supernova going off. How can molecules survive this horrible environment? Uh, and so it took roughly 30 years before radio astronomy hit a boon. And so radio astronomy has enabled us to observe a host of molecules in space. And that's because in the radio, you're observing gas at very, very low temperatures. And so typically molecules occupy cold media. And when it's very cold, the main way in which these molecules can emit their light is through rotation. When it's hot, they can do other fun things like water can stretch, it can asymmetrically stretch, it can wag. I don't know why I'm still wearing these. You guys didn't tell me. <laughs> you guys, useless. Uh, so, they can do, I was like doing a dance. This video is gonna be on YouTube somewhere with me and the glasses. <sighs> I mean, it already is on YouTube, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so radio astronomy helped us go from, you know, CH to 200 molecules. So space is a really astrochemically rich place. Uh, there are, well, it was 201, one of the graduate students in our group at, at Harvard recently knocked down the most massive molecule, or the largest molecule, uh, conventional molecule known in space, HC11N. Uh, so we're now back to 200 on the dot. Uh, but there's mostly small guys, you know, two atoms. But we do see things up to sort of 12 atoms in size. And they're really just everywhere. Earth, obviously, plenty of molecules here. But if you look at asteroids, there are amino acids already in asteroids, like in the Murchison meteorite. Uh, in comets, there's ethane and formic acid and acetonitrile. Uh, and molecular clouds, which is the thing in the top left, you have really a really diverse chemistry of kind of almost everything, but you also have things like uh, C60, which is just like a ball of carbon atoms, a buckyball, if some of you are familiar. So these things exist in space, and they're not completely wiped and destroyed. And so this, this rich chemistry is also seen in the disks around these young stars. So here they just labeled it with CO, but we see far more. And even in the, uh, uh, near the environments of massive dying stars, where there, you've seen complex molecules uh, like uh, acetylene over here. And so, okay, so how does all this stuff survive? Well, fortunately, it doesn't really, it's not that harsh. There are parts of the space that are actually pretty quiescent. And they were originally discovered uh, by William Herschel as holes in the heavens. And so he saw all these stars, and then he saw a giant dark spot. And he said, here, it must be, my German's a little rusty, uh, you know, a hole in heaven. Uh, he, he said there's basically stars everywhere, but in that spot. Bernard, uh, Edward Bernard came in a little bit, you know, later and said, actually, no, there's just a clump of stuff and it's blocking our view. 
And, and we can't really hold it against Herschel because actually that cloud in particular is pretty close to us. And so there's not really uh, many stars in that line of sight. The stellar density is pretty low. So it, it looks a lot darker uh, than if it were a little bit further away and you had a sprinkling of stars in front. And, and now we can just take an image in a longer wavelength light and you see right through it. So that's in the infrared. So there are stars all throughout uh, behind this cloud. They were just hidden from our view when you looked at visible light. Um, these clouds are pretty uh, cold, they're pretty dense, they're 10 Kelvin roughly, 15 Kelvin in some environments, above, that's above absolute zero. So these are extremely cold environments, they're pretty dense, like 10, 10, uh, a million parts per centimeter cubed of H2. You have, um, the sizes are typically, in this case this object is only half a light year across, but they can be a few light year across, it depends on how massive they are. This one contains about two solar masses, so it'll probably maybe collapse to one little bit low mass star. And then the, the, the very center is dark, as you can see. So there, there, there's a lot of extinction. Light from the outside isn't making it into the core. So you're not destroying your molecules with harsh radiation, it's shielded and protected. So, so what kind of chemistry can occur? Well, at these densities, it can only be two body things, because if you wait for a third guy to come along, it's just it's gonna take way too long. So it's dominated by reactions between two species, and they have to be barrierless. If you require any energy to make a reaction occur, at 10 Kelvin, it's not going to happen. It's just so cold. There's no extra energy to make chemistry happen. And actually, we're trying in, in many labs across the world, this one's the one at Harvard, trying to simulate this environment in, uh, in a lab environment. And so over in the left, this is actually a lab that's in, uh, simulating interstellar ice. You see a chamber. And that's uh, at ultra high vacuum conditions, and it's at 10 Kelvin. And on the, on the, the, that's the left, on the right is Pablo, one of the postdocs in the group, you know, examining a ball and stick molecule, obviously in lab regulated footwear. Uh, it, wasn't, it was nice, he posed for me. Uh, so, yeah, so this is the, trying to simulate the conditions in space, but actually, even this, this gets to less than one trillionth of an atmosphere of pressure. So one atmosphere is here, one trillionth is in that, that sphere. It takes a long time to get it down there, you have to pump it out for a long time. Uh, but space is still 100,000 times less lower pressure. So it's even getting to one trillionth is hard, but space is still in some ways a unique lab to study chemistry. I had some examples, but I want to get closer to the end. Um, if you tried to actually make water, for example, is that you? Okay. Oh, okay, wow. <laughs> All right, that's not moving anymore if you were watching. <laughs> All right, um, so if you tried to wait for the very abundant molecular hydrogen to find oxygen and make some water, uh, you're going to be waiting for a really long time. And if there are any burgeoning astrochemists, which is a, actually like in a complete field now, uh, there's a website at the bottom. You can look up at all the different kinds of reactions that we know of that occur in space. You can even plot them and see you know, how fast do they go or how slow do they go. This one in a cloud, even if you turn that cloud to 100 Kelvin, if you turned up the temperature a little bit, you'd still wait 5 trillion years. <laughs> and that's a lot longer than the age of the universe. You're not, that's not going to happen. That cloud will be long be gone. So will, so will we, but you know. Uh, but if you now ionize this, this molecule, the H2 out front, did it work? There it goes. You can form sort of an unstable, or H3O plus uh, ion, which then can recombine with some free electrons sitting around and make water. And this only takes a year, which sounds like a long time, but astro uh, astronomically and astrochemically, that's instantaneous for us. So this reaction can occur very efficiently. This is one of the ways you form water in dark clouds. But where did I, you know, where did this magical ionization come from? Well, actually, the cool thing is, at least to me, is that in the cores of these clouds, the source of ionization is primarily from interstellar cosmic rays. So these are relativistic particles uh, that are coming from afar, coming, they're accelerated in the, the shocks of distant supernovae. And you might remember, you know, we went back, all of these atoms were, you know, forged in the interiors of stars, we're all star stuff. But at the same time, those same dying stars are creating the population of energetic particles that facilitate this cold chemistry. They're providing the source of ionization that makes much of this chemistry happen. 
So we almost we owe double to those stars for both providing those atoms and starting up this chemistry. So uh, I, we, have de we have more demos. Um, so these cosmic rays pervade the galaxy. And a few of them actually, well, our sun and its wind actually shield us from most of them, or more than 99% of them, the low energy ones. But the high energy ones still make it through. And so here is a nice little video of the particles uh, bouncing off of our heliosphere. And um, some of them, as you see, go through. And, and the oscillation is just the 11-year solar cycle. So when at solar minimum, the wind is a little bit weaker, the heliosphere shrinks in a little bit, and so more cosmic rays make it in, where at solar maximum, it's the opposite. So this is actually a cosmic ray telescope, and we can listen to those cosmic rays uh, hit, while well, they're hitting the atmosphere, they're creating what's called a hadronic shower, and where we can detect from here, even through all these buildings, the muons coming out of this cascade. So those, it's not static. Those are actual particles. There were, there they are. Uh, that are coming from these distant supernovae. The same particles that are sort of stimulating the chemistry of interstellar space in this room. Um, so the sound is only when they pass through the top and hit the bottom. So these are only particles that are coming from directly above. Okay. Cool, huh? All right, that worked. So, all right. Oh, there was an example. So, um, yeah, these, these, the cosmic ray itself hits the upper atmosphere, creates a shower, and then we, the f we hear the stuff that's hitting the ground. I put a plane in there for scale. So the cosmic ray is hitting well above, you know, where your, your commercial jetliners are flying. Don't worry. Um, we're just sensing the decay products. So you're not being bombarded by 200 MeV particles as you fly. Though, so, no. <laughs> there is some extra radiation. So let's see. All right, so we have this rich chemistry in the cloud. How does this actually get transferred to planets? Uh, so this is only a very brief sort of picture of how we go from molecular clouds to planetary systems. Up here at the top left, we have our dense molecular cloud. It has a very rich chemistry. You remember that list of long list of molecules. Uh, parts of that cloud will begin to collapse under their own self-gravity and form a, a, a smaller core, which continues to collapse into a young star, or maybe multiple stars, maybe a binary. That, because the cloud has a little bit of rotation, it always does, we're in a big rotating disk, no surprise, uh, of the Milky Way. Um, that molecular cloud's rotation is preserved through the conservation of angular momentum, and it sets up a circumstellar disk around that star. That disk is being fed from the collapsing material. That's the fluffy stuff on the sides. Looks like a butterfly, kind of, right? It's a short-lived phase. I will, this mouse thing, here it is, ah. Uh, lasts, oops, 100,000 years. And eventually the cloud dissipates. You're left with this isolated protoplanetary disk like in the title slide, where you have a lot of time. You have 10 million years to form your planets. Of course, it's always better to see things in movies. So this it was actually a press, or a, uh, one of the James Webb telescope uh, public outreach videos they put out on how James Webb will probe star, for, star and planet formation uh, in action. So you have here the cloud, here the natal disk forming. You see the little spiral arms starting to wind up. Uh, and it's growing in mass. It's getting a little brighter. And it will, you know, cut ahead because we, we don't have all of cosmic time to wait and to and zoom into the disk itself. So there's the central star. This will become an unstable disk. You'll see some big spiral arms starting to, to form and some condensations, some potential future planets starting to form out of this disk. So it's a very nice video. These disks look pretty similar to uh, the interstellar medium out of which they form. No surprise. They are mostly molecular hydrogen with some helium. And then all of our good stuff that goes into us, the carbon and oxygen and nitrogen, is a trace percentage. They have a component of which that is dust. Over there is an interstellar dust particle, sort of similar to the dust grains that our planet formed out of. And at low temperatures, they become coated in ice, like water and CO and CO2 and ammonia, all those good uh, prebiotic ices. And so the, the general composition of a given system is set largely by the host star. It's hot, close in. 
And so the material very in the innermost regions is very warm, and so you end up with very with, with an ice poor chemistry, which you know harkens back to our old ideas of the solar system, uh, to a to an ice rich outer disk chemistry. So what it looks like if you, you actually plot this out, you have an ionized surface because these young stars do throw uh, throw fits. They have high energy X-rays and high energy UV, so they can ionize the surface. But that gets attenuated eventually, and you have a molecular layer. Uh, where you form these things like CO and N2. And then once it gets cold enough, you form these rich icy mantles, the things that eventually get incorporated into planets. And, and for those that you know, follow this, these are sort of the locations where this happens. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, go, is is uh, where it goes from gas to, to ice in the mid plane are called snow lines. You may have seen that in the press. So if you form a planet in the outer disk, they'll be ice rich. If you form a planet in the inner disk, it will probably be mostly rocky. And if you form a planet really, really far out, you get some cool ice, uh, like CO and cool, I guess I shouldn't use that term, into, uh, and actually the, the recently the New Horizons mission, the mission that went out to Pluto, uh, images, imaged the surface of, of Pluto and actually uh, uh, measured and, and took pictures of ice, nitrogen ice flows in the surface. So this was, you know, this planet, or pl dwarf planet, Pluto, see I tripped. Uh, the dwarf planet Pluto, you know, formed so far away that it actually got a lot of nitrogen ice, which is hard to get. You have to form very, at very low temperatures to get that nitrogen ice. So up there is the, the ice flows. They're beautiful. Just, you could spend a day looking at New Horizons uh, pictures and videos. And so there's sort of a, a classical picture where, let's see, the, uh, the composition that a planet gets depends on the distance it is from the star, and that's because sort of if you... Hmm, there it goes. Have water, water freezes out pretty quickly, you form water ice at pretty high temperatures. So only in the innermost disk is there water vapor, and then beyond that you have water ice. So anything that forms beyond something like the Earth-Sun distance, 1 AU, will inherit a lot of water ice. If you go a bit further, like to 10 AU, you might get a little bit of carbon dioxide ice, which freezes out a little bit later, and so forth, and uh, out, all the way out to CO, and N2 is at a similar location. And so this, as these different ices freeze out onto the grain, you actually shift the balance of how much carbon and oxygen there is available in the grains, on the, in the ices, and in the gas. So you may remember even that, that one planetary system I showed you earlier where they measured the compositions of those four planets and they had different C to O ratios. So maybe we're seeing some of that, uh, though it's hard to tell because there may have been restructuring dynamically in the system. Uh, let's see. So. We've known disks exist around young stars for quite some time, uh, at least 40 years, but we didn't actually, we couldn't take pictures of them. We saw, you know, for them, we saw that the star itself had, you know, a black body-like spectrum. You've probably seen this in other Saturday morning physics. Uh, so here's the star, the blue, or not the blue region, this should be the star. So this is mislabeled down here, sorry about that. There's the star, and then, um, as you have a black body at high temperature, or going from high temperature to low temperature, the black body uh, radiation, which is just a spectrum versus wavelength, it shows you how, what is the photon energy distribution coming out of an object that emits all the light that's incident on it. Uh, black bodies of very hot things like stars tend to peak at very blue word temperatures, and they tend to be brighter. While black bodies at lower temperatures, uh, like from cooler dust grains, uh, tend to peak at redder wavelengths and have a fainter temperature. And there's a demo. I, if it works quickly, I'll use it. But over here, yeah. so here is my, oh, there's a camera? I don't know where it is. Here's our star. Oh, sweet. Thank you. Uh, and here is our black body. It looks roughly like the plot I showed you, so a curve with a tail, so a sharp rise and a shallow decay. So if we measure the peak of this black body over here for our star, it's right about there. You have to smooth over some of the oscillations, which are some artifacts in the detector. So that's our star spectrum. Now we go down to the cooler dust grains that are surrounding the star. And it went all the way down there. So it's obviously a lot fainter, so the whole curve decreased, right? But we can renormalize it so it makes it a little easier on your eyes. And you may have noticed the peak also shifted to the red. So this is 
this shows you how we can have sort of a combination of black bodies within a system that can tell us that you have both hot material from the star and cooler material from dust surrounding it, which is what's shown um, in this plot. And you can even get creative. So let's say you are missing the green part, but you have some of the red stuff remaining. Like say you have a, a system where the inner parts have completely cleared, been cleared out by maybe planets. You can actually see that in your global spectrum on the left, so or there's a star at the top, uh, a full, complete, pristine disk in the middle, and, oh, thank you, uh, and then a disk that's missing the innermost parts, shown on the bottom, and you can actually infer structural information without ever making an image. That's what we did for a long time. Um, there's one example of really nice observations. People got very creative, assigned lots of components, uh, but this sort of does combine a lot of what's going on into one bucket. This is a spectrum. This is not telling us directly things about uh, distance. It's all indirect. You have tiny grains emitting here. You have large grains emitting here. And they might be coming from different environments. And so the, the way in which these grains grow um, is illustrated here. So you, have, you start off with a lot of small grains. That's the beginning point of all of our rocky planets, including Earth. You have tiny grains. Uh, one one hundredth the size of a human hair. And those fill the interstellar medium. That's, that's point zero. Then those have to get all the way to large rocky planets like Earth or, Jupiter, or the cores of Jupiters. And this is actually one of the biggest unsolved problems in planet formation is how do you go from that, those min, that range of orders of magnitude. Uh, and it's easy at the beginning because small grains are coupled with the gas and they get pushed around. And at the very end, you have gravity helping you along. But in the middle, those things are typically lost uh, by aerodynamic forces from the gas. And they typically just get dumped onto the star uh, by these aerodynamic drag forces. Or if they're colliding, they collide and fragment, which is not good for getting bigger. It's, it's good for getting smaller. Uh, and so I have, I think, is this my last demo? I think it's my last demo. Ah, yeah. Where is it? Oh, here it is. So we have in this little microscope slide lots of little our interstellar dust grains. These are a little bit bigger. They're about 2 microns in size. Uh, the ones in, this, in space are like 0.1 microns in size. But it makes it a little easier to see here. And you see them wiggling, right? And that wiggle is coming from the, the temperature of the water in this case. So it's a water uh, substrate rather than gas, which is what we have in space. But it works in the same way. The non-zero temperature of the water is forcing the little dust grains, kicking them around, and causing them to jostle. And in fact, you have some of them getting together and sticking. I don't know. Do I have a mouse on this? Yeah, I do. So these guys seem to really want to stick together, maybe. But then they kind of keep ejecting each other. Oh, there we formed a really nice little clump. So that's the beginnings of planet formation, right there in that you know little little slide. Of course, we're going to cut it off. Unfortunately, it's. We're going to run out of material pretty quickly. It's going to be a pretty sad planet. But that's, that's sort of the beginnings right there. That's actually a really nice cluster. I'm actually, I expected two pieces to come together, not like a whole clump. And they're colliding and sticking by van der Waals forces. Uh, in space, though, you might have remembered earlier that we have ice as well. And that ice helps make things a little bit stickier and enhances this process. Uh, there are so many interesting lab experiments that I'm not going to show you, but I wanted to show you just one plot or when a figure where people are working on this process of watching how grains grow together, uh, by, uh, which, which fundamentally is set by the, veloc the relative velocities and the sizes of the two particles hitting each other. Uh, Jurgen Bloom's lab is, is one of the world leaders in this. And so at the top, you have a very low speed collision where these two blobs here and here. Oh, all of these experiments are conducted in uh, drop towers, where it's a very tall tower. You drop it at the top and you get microgravity for a couple seconds, or catapults, <laughs> which is pretty cool too. I mean, I don't get to, I don't get to throw anything in my, like, I, I just do computer simulations. Like, I don't get to catapult. Uh, and, and there's actually some space-based experiments. So then you have way more time. Here you have, like, seconds. So you hope that something happened because, you know, your experiment's already done. So the top, you had these two, th these two guys collided. These guys went too fast, so they collided, and then they broke apart. They bounced is the actual scientific term. And then the last one, they went too fast, and they fragmented, so they didn't grow. 
And so the end product of this dust growth process, we have remnants of this in our solar system and, and mostly in the form of comets. So comets are one of the most pristine examples of our early primordial solar system material. Asteroids, some of them are primitive, but many of them have been processed by the latent heat trapped from radioactivity from the, uh, the star, form, star forming region from which they formed. So these guys, they're pretty much minimally altered. They're giant rubble piles. This guy has the density of talcum powder. He looks pretty, you know, frosty, right? This is your favorite 67P, the ducky comet that uh, they sent the, the Philae lander to, unsuccessfully, sadly. Um, and so this thing is extremely fragile. It's actually more fragile than they were expecting. And it put constraints on the number of comets there could be at large distances from our sun because they otherwise would have collided too often uh, and, and smushed together and heated each other up. And this thing has never been had a, a high-speed collision. Even these two bodies that came together came together at very low velocities. Um, otherwise, it would have uh, lost a lot of the chemical richness uh, very quickly, devolatilized. And so, let's see. They, they put out some really nice infographics you can check out later from ESA uh, that highlight this very low density, high porosity regions. But uh, in addition to the, comp uh, to the density of this object, they discovered tons of molecules. So this is the benefit of when you get to go somewhere. You know, for astronomy, we have to observe and you passively get what light comes to you and it's the molecules that emit and the wavelengths you're looking at. But when you go somewhere, you get to gather a little bit and have a mass spectrometer and split it up and see everything you have in, in, your, uh, in your collection. And so this was a cute press release that came out of the cometary zoo where you have like stinky molecules for the skunk, uh, they, 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 there was some nice European humor in here too. Um, the salty beasts, so the ocean fish. Well, it's hard to read, I'm sorry. Uh, the alcohols, the monkey is like the crazy alcohol one. Uh, methanol and ethanol. But uh, so we're, we have these wonderful samples of, of the end products of planet formation. And before I run out of time, I just want to show that we're now actually not just having to rely on the historical sample in our solar system, but we're able to actually make some images of planet formation happening uh, right now around other stars. And so you may have seen this before, maybe, half and half, uh, where this is actually real data of a real young star, half a million years old, it's in the very center, and uh, it was taken with the, At the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, or ALMA, shown at the bottom. And the resolution, the, the resolution element in, the, in this image is about 5 AU, so five Earth Sun distances. This is unprecedented. We used to have resolution of 50 AU, which is like the Pluto Sun distance, right? So this entire thing would have been one just data point. Now we have beautiful images. We don't have to rely on these, the black body spectral energy distribution you just saw. Uh, we also have beautiful images, not only in the, this was a radio image, uh, radio interferometer down here with these rings. This is a different disk, but also shows rings. Rings seem to re, every time we take a picture, we keep seeing rings. Seems to be pretty common. Uh, but we can also take images in the optical and the scattered light and also see rings. Although the scale on this image is much finer. It actually beat, this is not an HST image, but there, we, there is an HST image separately. And the resolution on this radio interferometer beat Hubble. It's so good. Now, this, these images though, I'm not showing composition. I'm just showing you thermal dust emission. And so this is the dust that's building up our rocky planets and our gas giant cores, but it doesn't tell us anything about its composition in detail. We don't know exactly how much water it has or ammonia. Uh, but fortunately, we're now just entering uh, the era where we can start imaging the gas in a similar way and seeing some beautiful rings. It's a lot harder to do this. It's way harder. If you are curious, I'll, I can tell you about afterwards. Uh, but we're starting to actually, this is a sulfur bearing compound on the left, CS, uh, and it's starting to see some neat structures in that too. And those are on sort of the same scale. So that seems to be a real ring in the optical and the, the tiny grains in the gas. So we're really on this, the brink of measuring these compositions of disks and hopefully linking them to the planets in our solar system, but also the exoplanets. Of course, it's, it's, it's a tricky business because we're observing a lot of the molecules. That's what we see in the gas. But this, the mid-plane, or ah, jargon, the icy uh, center of the disk 
is not easily directly observable. And so you have to often use models, which is where I am. I'm, I do more theoretical models of the chemical structure of disks to sort of infer what do we, we have the surface, what does it mean for what lies beneath? You can think of it almost like a, a glacier, not a glacier, uh, an iceberg, that's the word, thank you. <laughs> yeah, where you see just the tip. Uh, and so imaging helps us answer a couple of really key questions. It tells us, you know, what is the typical disk compositional profile? Where do we fit into that sort of what is typical? Do you have a gradient of oxygen and carbon uh, and nitrogen as well? And, and how often you know, do you get habitable light -like compositions in other disks? It also tells us something about, potentially, if you see those rings in the previous image, one possibility is that those are being cleared by planets. It's not the only possibility, and so that's why I hesitated to say it earlier, but it's one exciting possibility that those are little tracks cleared out by forming protoplanets. And so if that is confirmed, we can start to say something about the initial position where planets formed and the later positions. Are those close in exoplanets actually forming further out and moving inward, or did they form closer in and they're still there to stay? Now, you know, we, we have this, this solar system-centric perspective on you know, what compositions we need for a habitable planet. We should also probably expand our definitions for what is that in fact habitable. And so to go back as an example, I have Enceladus shown here on the left. We can take a slice of Enceladus, and this is the, the moon I told you about that has the global ocean. It also has vents, geothermal vents at the base. I can zoom in to make it a little easier to see. And it's the same, so it's a very similar environment to the vents in the bottom of our ocean, actually where we have tube worms. So, you know, life may not look like you and me, but it might look like tube worms, which would still be really cool to find. Be amazing. And actually, I have homework. I don't know if you guys have ever had homework in Saturday morning physics, but you can do this fun exercise where you can calculate the pressure at the base of Enceladus' ocean using the equation at the bottom, which comes from hydrostatic equilibrium, and compare it to the pressure at the base of Earth's ocean, and it comes out to be the same. It's really cool. And Titan II is another exciting prospect. Unfortunately, it's, it's so cold that you have methane lakes and not water lakes. There's water there, but it's all ice. Um, so you can't really form normal cells that are formed out of lipids, but this, just this past summer, I think, actually, uh, they detected vinyl cyanide with, again, ALMA, this, this radio telescope I showed you earlier, that naturally forms cell-like structures. So you could have an entirely different cell base um, on, on Titan. We don't know, we would have to go there. But you know, don't use rockets, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so just to, to summarize, our, our entire picture of, of how we thought planets formed as of 10 years ago is sort of being actively rewritten today. Uh, and so uh, much of that has been helped with the fact that we had the solar system-centric picture, and now we're moving towards a more statistical picture, um, helped by these surveys like Kepler. We are also uh, entering a new awesome era where we can actually start to resolve the process of actual planets forming in disks. Um, one of the images I showed you, so I showed you a 5 AU image, the other one had 1 AU resolution. We have very high resolution images. We're starting to get to the scales of individual planets in formation. Um, we see that there's structure in these disks. We see rings. These disks are being sculpted by something. Maybe it's planets, maybe something else. Um, but regardless, by imaging, doing this chemical imaging, we can start to say, what is the spatial composition across these disks, and what does that mean for the planets forming out of them, uh, if they are planets indeed? And so, and I just want to end also that in the last three years, we've gone from basically zero rocky habitable planets to, to 12. It's a huge jump in our understanding. And so these are potentially habitable. We don't actually know whether they're habitable or not. We don't know their composition. So we need to learn something about the chemistry of planet formation to say, on average, do we expect these things to be habitable? Do we expect these things to be basically just rocky worlds? But again, we have to you know, rethink what we mean by habitable. And, and essentially how, well, how fine-tuned is our solar system? Did we get a very special composition? Did we, get, uh, did we sort of win the lottery where we had a moon that helped us, or Jupiter helped us shield, shield us from bombardment um, from asteroid-like bodies? There's, these are questions that are still being asked and explored. 
But this is also sort of a nice segue slash plug to next week's talk, where you know, I talked about how, like, how fine-tuned was our solar system's formation, but next week you get to hear about how fine-tuned was the universe itself. So you should come and listen to Evan's talk, and with that I'll take questions. Thank you. <laughs>